Cormac McCarthy fans, today I'm going to be reacting to Epoch Philosophy's video, The Dark Philosophy of Cormac McCarthy. And I've received requests all week to react to this video. And I'm excited to do this. I haven't watched this yet, but I have watched a couple videos by Epoch Philosophy a couple years ago. And he does the classic video essay format, which is always very good. But I'm excited to see which angle he takes. And if you guys don't already know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to Cormac McCarthy on YouTube. I already have 150 videos on Cormac McCarthy in the playlist down below that dive into his life, his works, and deep and eccentric theories surrounding both his life and works. So let's hop into the video. What is the central locus of men? Is this centrality predefined? If so, is it biology, by society? Is there even a centrality at all? These are all questions posited by McCarthy. While all these things are subject to interpretation, I feel as if the central locus is not. And what might be this locus? That central locus is our capacity for violence, unfettered brutality thoughtless slaughter. All right, so I'm excited to see right here what books he mentioned. So we're taking the whole violent approach to McCarthy, you know, Blood Meridian, The Road. But let's see what other books he mentions, because I feel like, you know, this maybe isn't the central theme of McCarthy. It, some of his most popular books, Child of God, The Road, um, Blood Meridian, obviously focus on this. But then when you look at his collection of 12 novels and his screenplays, his plays and his unpublished works, then you kind of you kind of move into something different. Blood sport, blood ritual, from war to genocide, the business, all the way to our favorite sports. The endless cycle of brutality is not only something that continues to evolve, something we failed to overcome. These themes are present, and if not potentially popularized by McCarthy's work in No Country for Old Men, The Road, and his incredibly dark, thus far unfilmable, Blood Meridian. But it's not just violence McCarthy is concerned about, it's our navigation around it. The varied context and meaning spawning from a world bent on brutal domination and the varied ways in which civilization seeks to control it, yet let it loose in hidden ways. In order for us to go deeper into the weeds. The real way to go deeper into the weeds, and I already know that we're not going to get into this, how do we transcend that violence? How, do you, how did we get there? Who's keeping us there today? What structures in reality are making sure that kids who go through 12 years of education and have hundreds of thousands of dollars put, of tax dollars put into that education, how do they not figure out how to solve violence? How does how do adults who have unlimited education still not figure that, you know, are still not able to be able to figure that out? And once again, what is keeping us down, you know? That's something that once, you know, these video essays kind of do this kind of glance over these problems, but don't talk about the causal factors and solutions, but I'm excited to see. We should go into more around McCarthy himself. McCarthy okay, we're going was biography. born in Rhode Island to an upper middle class Irish Catholic family. This is, you know, one of these things that I, you know, I feel about video essays. You know, the problem with video essays is, first of all, you're not really connecting with your audience. You write out an essay. So you sit and down, you, you write out a script and then you just do video, video essays editing with animation. And so it's the kind of the same kind, kind of the same sequence. We first have to introduce, then we get to the problem because it's an essay. And you have to assume that the person has never seen this before, but that's kind of a, a disadvantage I think in the long run for BookTube and one of the reasons that BookTube is failing is that we have to focus narrow um and bring people in and then eventually expand out again. But I already know, you know, I get it. This guy's channel is not about Cormac McCarthy, so he has to bring people in. And let's see how he connects his biographical information to this violence. So why is McCarthy talking about violence? Well, well, it's actually be mostly because of father trauma, and I'm excited to see if we get that. But later I'm in his childhood, we relocated to Knoxville, Tennessee. The setting to one of his most beloved novels, Sutri. McCarthy lived in a relatively nice home, but was surrounded by people living in what was described as two-room shacks, smaller family dwellings inhabited by the working poor of Knoxville. Much of his childhood was spent rummaging through Knoxville and befriending children from his poverty-stricken neighborhood. McCarthy was was known to throw school to the wayside as a child, focusing on the things he felt more significant, such as reading, writing, 
I, I don't know where we got this. Uh, he was befriending the poverty-stricken kids in his neighborhood. If you actually go look at his neighborhood, it was a decent place to live south of Knoxville. Um, it wasn't it wasn't some uppity place, but his father was a lawyer. His father was very well-to-do, and he went to a private Catholic school. So a lot of the people surrounding him were doing very well. And the other thing that was failed to mention here, um, let's see. I'll, let's see if he gets in Writing the next 30 seconds. Drinking. This persisted up until the time that he went to the University of Tennessee, Okay, so we 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 missed the big thing here that his dad McCarthy's dad was a lawyer for the Tennessee Valley Authority, and his job was he was actually the leader of uh, eminent domain uh, and putting that upon these poor citizens. So with the Great Smoky Mountains National Park being created around this time, and then a bunch of new dams being created, there were people who had been on this land for over a hundred years who had um, either legally or legally been living in the uh, in the same place on these little small small acreage farms, you know. Um, up to 15 acres. And the problem was, was that some of the time these people didn't have titles or deeds to the land. And that created a lot of problems because, you know, first of all, McCarthy's dad would show up and they'd throw these people off the land. And some people would get money and some other people wouldn't get the money. And I think McCarthy, who had an affinity with kind of the poor folk because he was wandering around and talking to the elders and talking to the other children. So he was witnessing all these people or people very similar to them being thrown off the land. And his father, who had very high expectations of him and his brothers and, and sisters, was an authoritarian from what I could tell. And well, obviously who he was, he was, you know, he was a lawyer throwing people off their land and everyone's always like, it's just his job. Someone else would take, maybe they wouldn't, maybe at some, somewhere down the line, we would find someone who is a moral individual and wouldn't be, you know, doing these government insurrections of people off of their land that, you know, either they own or should be able to have because no one else wants it anyway. So where he later dropped out yet continued writing and made it a central focal point in his life. McCarthy was known for his rather austere lifestyle. Famously, he lived with his ex-wife in what she deemed a shack with no heat. After separating, McCarthy continued to live in poverty, writing away and taking life in his own accord. McCarthy also remarried, but had no plans of jeopardizing his writing career with the hustle and bustle of a nine to five. His second wife recounts much of their marriage as also living in a shack dwelling in the Smoky Mountains mountains with no running water or heat. Hilariously, his second wife recounts this time with, we were bathing in the lake. Someone would call up and offer him $2,000 to come speak at a university about his books. And he would tell them that everything he had to say was there on the page. So we would eat beans for another week. Like many writers, McCarthy never saw so once again, we're missing the analysis here. Like if we're going to do biographical information, that's great. But how does that lead to him writing about necrophilia in Child of God? Because around this time when he's with his second wife bathing in the lake, how does he get there? Well, Child of God actually wasn't necessarily uh, this pull from him being, you know, this violent individual or father trauma. It kind of is. But it was actually just because he needed money. He was so poor that he just wanted a quick story. And in his second novel, Outer Dark, there was this offshoot story that didn't make it to the final cut. And so he just started, um, and he turned that into Child of God. And then there, there were some murders um, a couple years before that were very big in the news and in the area uh, with a very weird character like Lester Ballard. So he, Lester Ballard, excuse me. So he just turned all of that into Child of God. And he had the balls to do it, obviously, because he had renounced his family, but he, we never really heard the problems with his family and why he pushed so far away against them and felt the need to write about some of these more extreme things because he was pushing back against Christianity. Sorry to say it, everybody. McCarthy realized that Christianity wasn't real. I know a lot of you guys out there are still trying to figure that one out, but you know he figured that out. And so he had to not just push away against his parents, but then the whole religious um, environment that he was living in. Um, we still have to do that today as people who have transcended Christianity. All right, continuing on. But imagine, you know, living in a very, you know, I went to a university in Utah and there were so many Mormons around me that, you know, it was hard to even breathe. It was hard to even live. And so that's what I'm sure it felt like for McCarthy trying to break free in the 1960s. Saw tangible success until decades later of writing. It was only after his release of All the Pretty Horses did McCarthy gain widespread recognition with his prior novels such as Blood Meridian and Suchery garnering acclaim 
decades later. McCarthy isn't a philosopher proper, and in my mind that's what makes the writer particularly interesting. From people like Kafka to Bukowski, Philip K. Dick, the narrative ambiguities allow us to parse questions. What a, what a, you know, so he talks about philosophical writers and we got Bukowski, Kafka, and Philip K. Dick. Uh, all right. Ironically, uh, in a much more direct manner, it allows us to explain and let me just say, even though I'm pointing out and providing more information, this is great video so far, right? This is very nice. I'm enjoying it. Like, this is chill. Experiment with the implicit text, meaning, or context that isn't exactly in front of us. I have personally been looking forward to covering Cormac McCarthy on this channel, and it seems so have my patrons which do subscribe and gain the chance to choose future videos as well. But there hasn't been an author who has captivated my attention quite like him. The endless themes, ambiguous tones, layered writing, things that structure a type of philosophy we can siphon from him. McCarthy has published a nonfiction work called The Kekule Problem, which I believe it's how it's pronounced. That alone likely necessitates a separate video though. It is here we will focus on his library of novels, the things he is best known for. Before we go much further, I will add that I will not add spoilers here. McCarthy's novels are incredibly important to me, and the last thing I want to do is jeopardize one's ability to dive head first that said typical video essay we can't we can't go deep man read the book you guys if you guys are watching Cormac mccarthy videos you're less than 50 hours away from finishing whatever you're doing right now turn on the audiobook go read you can easily read with the time you have hundreds of books a year i said hundreds if you're not reading over 100 books a year then you have a time management problem or you just don't care about reading and if you're watching videos on reading or writing then you need to at least be doing some of that and get to that level before you're over here. Um, you know, that's why I just don't even say spoiler alert anymore in my videos. And people sometimes get mad. Sometimes I say it. I'm just like, all right, if you're here learning, then it's you should already be done. The first read, getting through someone's bibliography is the easy part. The analysis and the work and the transformation is the hard part. We'll add context and explore the themes set by McCarthy. With a large catalog of works from McCarthy, I'll likely lean heavily into the works of his that felt most pertinent to me. Texts such as Blood Meridian. Here we go, here we go. We're, we're not gonna see the, the golden, golden text. Suchery, No Country for Old Men, The Road, and even his newest, The Passenger. Okay, we got The Passenger. Okay, let's go. Blood Meridian is what I believe to be his most McCarthy-esque, if you will, and is personally my absolute favorite novel of all time. I would say that The Passenger is more McCarthy-esque. It combines all the different elements of the South, the West, and science. Time. Blood Meridian follows the life of a character primarily referred to as the Kid, a lone wanderer who experiences the full brunt of the violent history of the American West. This book can be summed up as one of the most violent texts ever written. Much of the mainstream attention Blood Meridian has received is its inability to be filmed and made into a movie. From its incredibly unorthodox plot points and narratives to esoteric characters and most of all, its extreme depiction of violence and genocide. Yet, amidst the surface of narrative violence, there's an underground central figure that I think infiltrates all when it comes to McCarthy, and that is Tom Miss Hobbs. Of this video, I find that Hobbes may be the most defining figure in relation to McCarthy. So much so, in one scene in McCarthy's newest text, The Passenger, there is a passage where the protagonist reads Thomas Hobbes' defining piece, The Leviathan. It's sneaky, but McCarthy absolutely threw that book in there for a reason. Thomas Hobbes was writing from the early transitional state of monarchy into pre-liberal enlightenment political philosophy. This is good. Um him catching the hob. So on the rig in The Passenger, Bobby is reading uh, The Leviathan. And this is an interesting take because Hobbes isn't actually mentioned in the Cormac McCarthy archive, at least from what I've seen of it when I, I've went through most of the stuff there. So this is actually a good, good creative take. This is what we need, everybody. This is what I'm talking about. Let's go. Here we go. Hundreds of years later, it can be easy to skim past the historical anxiety in these periods. But at the time of Hobbes, the Leviathan, this was at the forefront. Hobbes was concerned about the state of nature. What is nature in its purest form? To Hobbes, nature is a constant state of war, a state of all against all. Hobbes famously says, life in the state of nature, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And the condition of man is a condition of war, 
of everyone against everyone. Again, the historical place here is important. At the time of the 15th century, Hobbes was concerned about the newer type of governance that was being proposed. So I think trying to connect this to Blood Meridian is good, but I think it's missing the point. So why is Bobby reading the Leviathan out when he's on the rig? Well, he's reading it because it's a critique, obviously, of the American state who is um, pushed into his own life. So Bobby is on the run from the FBI, CIA, whoever. And the, the, it's implied they're coming after him because of some of his father's documents. Maybe Alicia is the missing passenger. There's all these different things, but it's related to nuclear weaponry. And one of the principles of Hobbes and the Leviathan is that the multitude need to come together to elect leaders, to elect the except, exemption state, the exempt from the laws, from the ideas that everyone else is following. Um, and so that's what our president's are. That's what our politicians are. We have given them the moral authority to rule over us and as the United States rule over the rest of the globe. And what did they do with that power? Well, they decided to, you know, unleash two nuclear weapons. However you feel about that is one question, but they had the sovereign power and they didn't have to listen to us at all. Some of the scientists, you know, Oppenheimer wasn't pushing back against it as he was making it, but there were questions about why we were, you know, continuing to use these weapons when they were first being made to be used against Germany and why are we now putting them on Japan? And with anyway, we won't get too lost on the nuclear question because McCarthy never gives his real opinions, but I think that's why Bobby was actually reading the Leviathan and why that was instrumental. But I we could argue because he was writing, he started writing the passenger in the 1960s and was working on it in the 80s that uh, Hobbes is also influential on Blood Meridian. So let's see. One away from monarchy and into a liberal political philosophy of rights, or in many ways, in Hobbes's mind, the lack of governance. Hobbes was most concerned about society falling, returning to the brutish state of nature that haunted him. The king, the monarch, the Leviathan was the one centerpiece holding everything together. Both authoritarianism and nature were brutish to Hobbes, but he thought one to be much, much worse. We see this clearly within Blood Meridian. The entire text follows a meta-narrative of war, from the early pages surrounding paternal abuse, to the relentless pursuit of what is described by Blood Meridian's infamous character, the Judge, as blood ritual. I'll leave the explicit context of this for all who decide to read Blood Meridian. It's not as simple as it seems. These things are present in the context of the Wild West within 19th century America. The lack of any cohesive order, one of genocide, the ruthless destruction of Native American peoples and culture throughout the American continent. Blood Meridian is known for some of its more esoteric content and writing, but one of its more challenging, notoriously confusing, and in my mind, brilliant sections is the epilogue. But to many, it's incredibly short, cryptic, and confusing. Here's the entire thing. In the dawn, there is a man progressing over the plain by means of holes which he is making in the ground. He uses an implement with two handles, and he chucks it into the hole, and he enkindles the stone in the hole with his steel, hole by hole, striking the fire out of the rock which God has put there. On the plain behind him are the wanderers in search of bones, and those who do not search. And they move haltingly in the light, like mechanisms whose movements are monitored with escapement and pallet, so that they appear restrained by a prudence or reflectiveness which has no inner reality. And they cross in their progress one by one that track of holes that runs to the rim of the visible ground, and which seems less the pursuit of some continuance than the verification of a principle, a validation of sequence and causality, as if each round and perfect hole owed its existence to the one before it there on that prairie, upon which are the bones and the gatherers of bones and those who do not gather. He strikes fire in the hole and draws out his steel. Then they all move on again. There is that was very nicely read. That was very nice to listen to. ...on exactly what this entire epilogue means. Besides creating the world's largest run-on sentence of all time, I believe this to be McCarthy envisioning fence layers. Settlers 
for ranch hands in the West, digging post holes upon a barren land that has seen war, genocide, and the very brutish elements deep from within Hobbes. After the violent odyssey we witness in Blood Meridian, McCarthy leaves us with this, the process. Okay, so we just talked about the epilogue. I will put a video link down in the description below of me explaining the epilogue in full. But we, what we just got there was the common version, the commonly accepted version. But if you kind of expand into some of the deeper theories about Gnosticism or something, that that's, uh, first of all, a big Gnostic metaphor. And he also kind of failed to mention how it could also be a metaphor of this kind of coming world that's actually more violent, that maybe Judge Holden is being phased out when we're moving into the age of the railroad, of nuclear weapons, like we're moving to towards something much deeper, which kind of connects to the thalmatomide kid in The Passenger and other things. Um, and so obviously the barbed wiring and the end of the West, that's like nice, but um, let's see, let's, let's see what history. He clarifies Many here. describe Blood Meridian as a work of anti-colonialism. In a way, this is what I was expecting. Yet the narrative and themes speak a bit different. I want to posit a different approach here, something much more dark. An explicit socio-political or moral analysis, I believe, is missing something critical to the text. That being, you cannot be against something that is inherent to all of us, and you cannot escape it. You can certainly try, and try we should, but at the end of the day, it's all we really can do. McCarthy almost posits a metaphysics of violence. Thus, the only way to curtail violence is to then subvert it into newer means, things that we don't typically see as violent phenomenon, happenings such as business, indoctrination, civil society itself. Yet even this to McCarthy, or even Hobbes, is much more desirable than the former state of nature. It's a recognition that we should build human organization up, but be completely prepared to face our violent impetuses in newer lights. This brings us to- Okay, that I- okay. No Country for Old Men. <laughs> Arguably the most well known Nothing really work say of there. McCarthy's as it was I feel like we could have gone that was we were there, but we could have gone deeper there. I mean there I mean okay, let's see what happened. Adapted we might get, by the get Cohen here. brothers into really one of the best films ever made. The story is a neo western revolving around Sheriff Bell, an old time World War II veteran turned peaceful sheriff who lives a relatively easy life in an easy going town with minimal crime. He's presented with a situation that turns his life upside down and makes him question notions of progress, civility, and even mortality. There is so much synergy between Blood Meridian and No Country for Old Men, I feel it accurate to call the latter a distant sequel. What happens when the American West is conquered after the events of Blood Meridian? Is it really so? Much of Blood Meridian and No Country for Old Men follow the century-old philosophical concept of the eternal return or eternal reoccurrence. Nietzsche, a modern reviver of so in Blood Meridian, obviously, we have the palindromes, we have the mirroring of the text all throughout the text, which is playing on this idea of eternal recurrence. He could get to this idea um, also in Sutri. Sutri um, plays upon this even more. That's kind of the whole philosophical theme of Sutri is one of eternal reoccurrence or reincarnation. And then if we look at some of his other novels, that's also very present. He's missing the Border Trilogy in here because when you look at McCarthy's Westerns, they're actually just one big arc. We have the end, end of the West kind of with Blood Meridian. Uh, of the Wild West. And then the Border Trilogy is kind of closing that up, though, the end of the West in general, because by the time we get to No Country for Old Men, like being able to ride your horse around and um, across lands and cut wire and stuff, that is not practical with everything that's going on now. Um, but that was more practical in the 1940s and early 50s, which the Border Trilogy was taking place in. And then uh, the Border Trilogy, excuse me, No Country for Old Men actually climaxes with the counselor. So, okay. Uh, the Eternal Return speaks on this question here. This life, as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more, and there will be nothing new in it. But every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you all in the same succession and sequence. Now, in isolation, this can be and often is interpreted as a personal singular question something merely of one's own life. But Nietzsche has broader implications here. You've never been in trouble before. That is, you've never been arrested before. That's right, Judge. What about your family, Joe? Your father and mother? Oh, they're swell. Do we ever escape anything? 
Do we ever truly escape trauma? How might we bear the weight of understanding that life doesn't truly have chapters, where things are permanently cordoned off? How do we cope with the understanding that our every release into the world will be felt over and over again? This is where many stop with Nietzsche and why he has been incorrectly bastardized as a self-help philosopher, but this question isn't merely personal. Nietzsche has metaphysical and historical implications here, at least within some later interpretations by individuals such as Deleuze. This echoes the whole time is a flat circle mantra, happenings destined to repeat itself. Sure, history can progress, but at the same time, it falls back within itself, a sphere that spins nice yet transition. moves in a linear fashion. Nice. In this vein, there's a specific cryptic, well-renowned scene in No Country for Old Men where Sheriff Bell describes his dreams to his wife. And Tom, I'll be polite. All right, then. Two of them both had my father in them. It's peculiar. I'm older now than he ever was by 20 years. So, in a sense, he's the younger man. Anyway, the first one I don't remember too well, but it was about meeting him in town somewhere. So he gave me some money. Thank a lot. The second one, it was like we was both back in the older time, and I was a horseback going through the mountain night, going through this path. Now, it was cold, and there was snow on the ground, and he rode past me and kept on going. He said, not back, back. Had his blanket to the head day. When he rode past, I seen he was carrying fire and a horn the way people used to do. And I, I could see the horn from the light inside it, about the color of the moon. And in the dream, I knew that he was going on ahead. And he's fixing to make a fire somewhere out there and all that dark and all that cold. And I knew that whenever I got there, he'd be there. And then I woke up. I think this scene is brilliant as it highlights Sheriff's Bell's subconscious grappling with these themes. A metaphysics of violence and eternal return to a root of our nature. One visualized with his father, an understanding of time bent upon repeating itself in different form. But let's get into the person, the self, with McCarthy. There is an immense psychoanalytic exercise I'm excited. I want to hear more here. Like, this is good. This is moving toward a lot of the theories. I'm sad that we're kind of moving away from this because there's a lot here that was pulled the good quote, pulled the classic quote. Um, Blood Meridian's epilogue and the dream at the end of No Country for Old Men are some of the more potent things that you could talk about in terms of McCarthy's work. So we're seeming to move by it, and he's just connecting it all to this metaphysics of violence scene, which, uh, excuse me, idea, which I think is good, but I wish we got a little bit more let's maybe we'll get some existential tonality throughout McCarthy's text. We see this with one of the most underexplored passages throughout Blood Meridian and is a later scene where the kid and the judge, characters in Blood Meridian, are talking in a saloon. One could well argue that there are not categories of no ceremony, but only ceremonies of greater or lesser degree. And deferring to this argument, we will say that this is a ceremony of a certain magnitude, perhaps more commonly called a ritual. A ritual includes the letting of blood. Rituals which fail in this requirement are but mock rituals. Here, every man knows the false at once. Never doubt it. That feeling in the breast that evokes a child's memory of loneliness, such as when the others have gone and only the game is left with its solitary participant. A solitary game without opponent, where only the rules are at hazard. Don't look away. We're not speaking in mysteries. You of all men are no stranger to that feeling, the emptiness and the despair. It is that which we take arms against, is it not? I think this leads us into a perfect segue around McCarthy's existentialism. An existentialism that encompasses this lack. In some corners, many consider McCarthy. That is a very, I mean, that's a good quote, but... Where is the explication? I know that was to help transition us, but that's some fire right there. Like that's some all rituals that don't uh, have the letting of blood or mock rituals. They're not real ceremonies. Like that's a powerful statement right there. That's a that we could dive into the hermeticism and the occult nature of Blood Meridian. And I understand that it's having a different, but it's it's not having a different meaning there. What it what really constitutes a ceremony anyway? Carthy Sutri to be his magnum opus, something in complete completely different tone than Blood Meridian or No Country for Old Men. But I'd argue the themes are completely present. They just contend with them in different ways. Suchery follows a fisherman who lives on a houseboat in Knoxville, Tennessee, who abandoned his wife and children 
alongside his wealthy family. Suchery can be seen as a type of autobiography of McCarthy, a lone man who lives in poverty by choice, and a type of person who just cannot, absolutely cannot help himself but to get into trouble. You all know someone, whether growing up, God forbid, an adult, who just cannot help finding themselves in bad situations, with the law, within relationship, even if it's not entirely their fault. Well, that's Suchery. Suchery is the incarnation of one's closeness or realization of lack a story of violence within civilized parameters. From punitive institutions, his time in prison, to police brutality throughout the story, religious institution, to his impoverished friends who find themselves at the mercy of others. There's this constant question in the background of Suchery. Amidst your suffering, why continue? This perhaps is highlighted even more so in McCarthy's newest text, The Passenger. Okay, before we get too deep into this, so McCarthy studied existentialism in his time in the air force it came he was the, the such was the first thing that mccarthy ever wrote and so he starts to internalize the existentialist like most of us did at kind of the early part of our reading and philosophy careers whether that's in your 40s or it's in your you know teenage years or in your 20s because it's appealing to us it helps us kind of develop develop and individuate and understand this newfound knowledge in our relationship to reality and so Suchery really is a great embodiment of the absurdist man, of the existentialist man, but he's trying to pull himself out of that. It, that's the whole novel is him trying to characterize or excuse me, polarize and pull himself away from that. Which in my mind feels like a spiritual successor to Suchery. Both the protagonists, Bobby and Suchery, are contending with a world hinged upon violence within confines of civility. And yet, not just explicit violence per se, but nature itself. There's a subtext within The Passenger that, I think, mirrors the work of Michel Foucault immensely. Concepts such as biopolitics, power, and madness. It's actually uncanny how much it does. Bobby is faced with a world hinged upon regulation and taboo, a world with the stark categorization found in modernity. The pursuit of normalcy creates a violent threshold that squeezes our ability to be, well, human. The pathological, deeply violent human effect from social ethics and norms founded in regulation of difference, such as disabled, queer, or non-Anglo individuals. Bobby. Wait, what? <laughs> he is a troubled Vietnam veteran. Just Yet his time in Vietnam at hold on. effect from social eth the pathological regulation. Hold on, where were we watching this? Hold on, hold on. A world with the stark categorization found in modernity. The pursuit of normalcy creates a violent threshold that squeezes our ability to be, well, human. The pathological, deeply violent human effect from social ethics and norms founded in regulation of difference, such as disabled, queer, or non-Anglo individuals. Okay. Bobby Other is a troubled Vietnam veteran. Yet his time in Vietnam, as violent as it was, wasn't the thing that troubled him. He was not a Vietnam veteran. I never was in Vietnam. No, I'm, there's a scene where he's talking to someone who's in Vietnam. Someone clarify him. 99.99999% sure Bobby was not in Vietnam. I'm actually 100% sure. He's able to grapple with the concept of war. War is the lack of regulation such that... I, okay, so this is all just kind of a miss here because... I, Bobby can parse he, it. He, he, he doesn't cannot into grapple war. with is the loss of his sister. He was a race car driver. Both were deeply and in love graduate with one student. another. Yes, you heard that correctly. Bobby seems to struggle within the ways in which we deal with our Hobbesian state of nature, the categories of right and wrong we bring into our world, ones that are at odds with ourselves. And yet, in a I don't, th this isn't that strong of a reading, obviously, because of the war thing, but I think it's more of a trauma. I think it's epigenetic trauma. I think that he's, you know, kind of getting into this war mentality and the confines of, of you know, this isn't, this, this is kind of missing the point, especially Twist. as a passenger. We can argue there's a level of a Cartesian mind body dualism here. Bobby's psyche couldn't care less about the regulations and categories we hold ourselves to. He deeply misses his sister. Yet throughout the story, he interacts within those regulations and categories nonetheless, making his psychological disposition null and void within materiality. He has no choice but to grapple with social bounds regardless. Again, McCarthy
he is only having to do that because his sister's dead. He has his memory. There's this ghost, this specter of the past that's pulling him away. He's not he's not dealing with that when he's with his sister, you know, until she, he eventually leaves to Europe to start driving. Murthy posits a negative metaphysics of violence. He pushes us to see violence beyond mere killing and the continual artifices we build up around ourselves. We've talked extensively around the concept of lack for metaphysics. I feel like that's like, this is that, that analysis right there is somewhat hollow and empty, even though we're talking about artifice. I wouldn't necessarily say that's what the passenger is about. There's themes of that in there, but I, I think it's much more about connection. I mean, I don't think that they're, I mean, doing a, they're, Bobby's not necessarily like there are scenes about Vietnam, but the nuclear war and there are jokes and uh, talk about psychiatric facilities and some of the stuff with the thalamide kid. And, but Bobby's on a spiritual journey. Bobby's not on this. He's not worried about society. He's worried about the soul. He's trying to, dis he's, there is a lack. Let's see what he goes. Let's see what, the, where this idea of scarcity or lack has physics. For to phenomenology or Lacan's concept of the real. The empty chasm, the baseline of our genuine reality. Our metaphysics being rooted in the philosophical concept of negation, which is to say nothing. The predisposed emptiness we are all running from, life, society, relationships, our perceptions are not but things to cover this chasm. If you are new to concepts like negation, lack, or the concept of Lacan's real, I'll leave some resources for you. This is the baseline for McCarthy, a central void, the emptiness we all feel, the only quote unquote real thing we have, the state of nature. From there, the artifices we use to construct our reality, the normatives, categories, ideology that we impose upon ourselves. The last main work I want to that so we, we get so that once again I feel like that's uh I mean looking at McCarthy's idea of nature I feel like that's like I don't think the critique is hey this is the real and this is the not real we never get McCarthy moving into the city or like trying to create that stark contrast nature is a secondary uh, is a character within the novel nature is this kind of guiding mythopoetic voice and it helps the tone the mood and it's also there as a form of animism it's not there to necessarily show artifice None of the characters in the Border Trilogy are necessarily dealing with artifice at that deep of a level. They're really more dealing with human nature and human action. The only real art uh, commentary on artifice is Judge Holden and his recreation and mimicry of things, and then the um, the whole coin dream scene and all that. Like that, that you know, we could kind of get into all that. But in general, that the the Lacanian real versus the unreal, that whole. You know, it's it's there, but I, we need more. Like you can't just pass by that. Like we, let's go there. Like I could I could make you know I I say crazy theories on here all the time. I'm not trying to sit here and say that it's like wrong because nothing is necessarily wrong. That's fine. But I in terms of cat, you know, one of the big punchlines you have to have with. Cormac McCarthy analysis, okay, how is nature functioning here? And using it just as a contrast, you know, as a contrast of there's nature, which is the real, then there's the whole lack and negation aspect. That's, you know, to focus uh, maybe on not McCarthy's great. philosophy is the road. As a literary piece, it's arguably his most popular, a post-apocalyptic story of the man and the boy who find themselves within an utterly destroyed world. It's not explicitly stated why the world ended, albeit I've personally settled on a conclusion, but I won't mention that here. McCarthy often keeps setting and even characters within a shrouded veil, something that needs to be further pressed through reading. But McCarthy's insistence on lack on Hobbes's state of nature is certainly visualized most directly here. The word that he needs here, we need to move away from Hobbes, it's entropy. McCarthy's more focused on this idea of entropy, which we could connect to Hobbes, but that, the, that it's running weak now. The thing about the road that hit me the hardest and what I imagine to many will also do is that it truly shows how catastrophic an apocalyptic scenario like this would be. The Road, more than nearly anything else, shows how much of a Hollywoodized mythos, renditions of apocalypse that is quietly infested in all of our brains. Disaster movies with heroes, villains, happy endings, quick deaths, video games such as Fallout that focus on the comedic irony of situation, capitalism, and the characters therein.
The road is much more terrifying than that. I agree. That nice, nice thoughts. Side note, we should have a thing where the minute politicians start talking about nuclear warheads as a mean of legitimate foreign policy is the minute we should probably force them to sit through something like the road alongside their family. Book or movie, either one will probably get the point across. We should do, we should make everyone think about that. Most people, we talk about our politicians, only one politician has used the nuclear weapons, you know, but most humans are have no consciousness no idea, no thoughts on nuclear weapons. Denuclearization, trying to, you know, move toward a reality where we don't have to live with nuclear weapons is like sugar candy mountain to some people. I mean, they can't even imagine that. Um, most politicians, most people can't. And most of us say, ig stay ignorant to the whole nuclear idea because we don't want to imagine something like the road. So that's what's, you know, the road is something that everyone should read. But I could see how like politicians should, you know, that's a decent point. You know, obviously, I don't know what he's trying to push or, you know, I, I assume he's talking about like these crazy right wing politicians, you know, in his view, like, oh, my God, Putin and Trump, they're good. They need to read it and understand empathy. But m most people are hawks. I mean, if we look at both parties, everybody, both sides sent us into the Middle East and kept us there. Obama. Uh, the left right now is really pushing, and the right, both of the left and the right right now are pushing for us to be in Ukraine, be involved with Israel. Um, it's endless. We we are a warring country. People, We are a hawkish by nature, and most people don't care, and, you know, it's foundational to us. It really cannot be. It's not foundational to America, let me say that. It's foundational to the cultural hypnotic programming that we've received over the last couple decades since really after World War II. We were an isolationist nation. We were really pushing those ideals, and we could have stayed isolationist. We didn't have to enter World War I. Um, the, the West would have won World War I. They didn't need our help. That war was over. World War II would have never happened if we maybe didn't enter World War I. There could have been a better negotiation plan there instead. We technically didn't need to enter World War II. Russia would have won. Russia would have defeated Germany without us entering. And why did we enter? Because we put oil sanctions on the Japanese because of us being involved in our own Chinese imperialism and colonization and things of that matter, being involved in the Philippines and imperializing them. We were involved in the whole game of tearing, you know, of imperial imperialization. And we technically could have avoided all of those wars and still ended up on top and ended up with a beautiful foreign policy. World War II didn't revive our economy. We have a massive landmass with a great population with a lot of great laws. And that's why we will we would have continued to prosper as a nation because of our, you know, if you look at Russia and China, they have so many different limitations, whether it's from natural resources or because of their totalitarian governments. And that's not what we have. If we didn't get involved, everything would have turned out pretty similarly um yeah anyway let's not get started on that whole this whole idea about you know everyone we this is new you know so both sides so i know he's i i i feel like he's implying that i'm not on the left or the right but i can just tell with some of his other videos and who he's into and the theorists that he's into that he's applying that you know right winger is going to nuke the world or something but you know we have to be scared about everybody even the local person my mom and my dad are hawks my mom is a liberal my dad's more of a moderate hawks it's crazy not be understated how dismal the visual of this book is and ironically beautifully so but like so many others within mccarthy's text it reflects metaphysically and also we have to you know move back to the individual causal factors solutions individual nonviolence. if we cannot solve and talk about individuals not being able to control their own emotions and actions toward others you know we can't just write off the people who get into bar fights and that's just crazy johnny johnny's crazy no johnny never was taught johnny ne needs to figure out how to keep his hands to himself because if johnny isn't then if that's not a worldwide thing if we're not really pushing for a nonviolent society which we're not as if you look at the policies and how we're treating criminals and how we uh, treat our education system and how seriously we take it and how we let violent kids slide through. I've been a teacher for six years. The school district I'm in right now is pretty good in terms of keeping the violent kids out. But the school district I was in, which is the one I think was at the time, like the third largest in the nation. I had kids who would get into fights. I well, Here's a crazy story. I had a, I had a kid who pay, tried to pay someone to kill the teacher at the school. And ended up being in the same class with the teacher and not getting switched out because it's seg because that teacher was the only teacher that taught that subject in the school and it would be segregation to move them out of that class. Kids who have attacked teachers before and come back in the same week, attack other students, come back in the same week because it's prejudice to suspend kids. 
uh, in a lot of these, at least in the school district, the school district I was teaching it. Um, so anyway, a lot, you know, there's no incentive. Same with zero bail. Same with, you know, uh, domestic abuse. You know, you could be, I've known people who have domestically abused other people and sat in jail overnight and gotten some community service about it, you know, because of that. No real training, no real accountability, no real action. And if the community tried to take accountability, if we all met up and beat the crap out of that guy for being the crap out of his wife or his girlfriend, what would happen to us? We would get in trouble. We would be, you know, organized malicious intent, you know, this was planned, you know, Johnny would just reacted, you know, Jeannie said something mean to Johnny and he was triggered because his dad beat him in earlier in life. And that's why he domestically abused, you know, her. And if we took retaliatory action against him, we would get a harsher sentence than he got for doing it in the first place. Everything's out of whack and violence is not taken seriously in society, um, especially in states where you can't even defend yourself in your own home. There are some states that if someone's in your bedroom uh, going through your things and you attack them and you kill them, you're the one going to prison. It's insane. Anyway. He walked out in the gray light and stood and he saw for a brief moment the absolute truth of the world, the cold, relentless circling of the interstate earth. Darkness, implicable. The bl and, and let me just repeat, once again, both the left and the right, conservatives and Democrats or liberals, both push violence. Liberals do this idea of zero bail and not punishing people who are violent. And then on the other side, there's this conservative notion of, you know, that I know a lot of hicks and rednecks and those type of people. And just, you know, uh, it, that type of people, you know, the WWE people in general have, they get into fights. They believe in violence. There's this kind of weird quasi honor, honor culture and, you know, being fueled by alcohol and stuff. And there's violence happening over there. It's not like both sides are pushing it in their own way. And I've witnessed it on the ground as a teacher from kids from all different angles and you know people without enough accountability and people who are being pushed toward violence um anyway blind dogs of the sun in their running the crushing black vacuum of the universe and somewhere two hunted animals trembling like ground foxes in their cover borrowed time and borrowed world and borrowed eyes with which to sorrow it despite the crushing tone and prose mccarthy brings forward the road is arguably the most hopeful and even optimistic of McCarthy's, primarily McCarthy's use of existentialism here, and existentialism that challenges some thought seen in absurdism. We can see the world as a void, one lack of meaning as it exists within a default state. This, he should have focused ex existentialism on Outer Dark or Sutri, where McCarthy was actually using existentialism at a high level, that like our specifically, own but we can, we can do it here. Our perception, our being, but it's our subjectivity as people that matter. I'd argue McCarthy goes beyond that. We haven't spoken about McCarthy's spiritual influence in his text. I don't, I don't see that was such a small analysis because like the subjective, I mean, the, I guess you could say in the road, they are living in this existential reality, but there's nothing there. They're not really living any type of reality. They're living in survival. They're in a survival mindset. They're at base consciousness. They're not even, they're not even able to have subjective reality. I mean, they're those small moments, but from almost mystical like figures and characters such as the judge or Anton Sugar. Spirit as an entity, a concept, however we might describe it, is often visualized within characters. In The Road, I'd argue McCarthy centers this into the setting because of the decay, because of the quite literally. Once again, not the best choice of time setting as a character. We finally got to it. Okay, great. But like the whole Border Trilogy, Blood Meridian, Sutri, um, almost every single other one of his novels, maybe than other than No Country for Old Men, would be a much more prime example of this idea. It's Lack infusing spirit into something else. Lack of life of all in the book. We must go beyond sight and sound into the sublime, beyond sense, beyond reason, beyond logic. We see this with the boy and the man's promise to one another to always carry the fire. This is a mantra shared throughout the text. We don't technically know what the fire is. This is a mantra. I think taking it to the sublime or these other things, I th it's pushing a little bit. It's never explicitly stated. Yet as collective humans, as the reader, we still understand it. The road encompasses a restless spirit of humanity that contends with this lack, this void in a modern sense. Much of McCarthy can be seen as, not exactly, but a type of postmodern author, at least in his narrative form. The Road flips this and is probably McCarthy's most modernist work. No explication there about why it's postmodern. 
Outer Dark is a postmodern nightmare brought to life. Outer Dark, uh, or the Orchard Keeper, is the hallucinations of a recollection. Blood Meridian obviously is um, very postmodern. Child of the Gods postmodern in the sense it's dealing with very taboo topics. Sutri is postmodern because it's dealing with these ideas of eternal reoccurrence and kind of taboo themes. All right. Much of this video has been a bit more vague than my others, but there is a direct reason for this. McCarthy's prose tends to be vague, and that's what makes his art damn powerful in my mind. The balance between the ambiguous and the explicit. He embodies this more than many writers, and I think it fair to carry that form throughout this video. At the end of all of this, I think we can sum up McCarthy as one of the greatest novelists of the 20th century. Don't be scared, homie. That's the whole point. McCarthy is an upgraded Hemingway in terms of iceberg theory. There is not a lot there because that means, and that means that you can actually theorize and go deep. And you and and you did go deep. And I enjoyed and I enjoyed when you were making these, you know, these movements. But you you have to follow through. You have to try and follow through. Like you know, country. And hopefully, this video did him and his writing justice. Thank you all for watching and making it the end. I've always wanted to make a video on McCarthy forever now and was happy to see that patrons here like as always all right I want to okay so this was objectively a good video you know 6.57 you know um obviously I have my critiques but these are I'm nitpicking here you know the only thing I could really say is I don't I don't care about any of these ideas I'm not like I'm not a dick I'm not like hey buddy you're wrong yada 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 that's fine be wrong I'm wrong all the time I make mistakes all the time you messed up Bobby being in Vietnam, cool. That only affected 20, 20 seconds of your analysis. Who cares, right? That's fine. I'm glad you're out here doing this uh, epoch philosophy. But you, try, you know, go deeper. You can do this. That's, you know, once again, that's kind of one of these problems with video essays. And just like the classic five paragraph essay or the college paper in general. There's just like this kind of paragraph. You get the paragraph. Just move through it. This idea. It's like, no, there's more here. Let's connect that back to something. Let's go deeper. You know, I don't know. If there's a time constraint, because I'm looking at his channel here, and it's like, obviously, you're seeing that, like, there's not that many long, vi long videos. And that's obviously because he's putting so much work into these videos. Like, damn, all that editing, you know, I know how to edit videos. I could do a video like this, but that just, that's, like, endless. That, that takes a long time. As you can tell, he's probably doing this full time, and he only released a video every couple months. And what we can learn here, what advice I would give to other people, maybe, is that you need to, like, let's look at this channel really fast. So, like... Like he's getting, you know, he's got 70,000 subscribers. Like he's got 2 million views. Like that's great. Right. But then this is the problem with these channels. Then you look at like his Patreon. Right. And so I don't know how many, mem how many members he has, but you can see that like, there's not too many likes. So that means that he's probably not in the hundreds. If you look at like other people's Patreons, if they post something, they get a lot of likes, you know, someone that's got, you know, in the thousands of members. So something that's sustainable. So if he's got 2000, 2 million views, he's, not full time with this yet. And that's one of the problems with video essays. That's why when you look at someone like Benjamin McBoy, it's him on the screen. He's talking to you and you develop a relationship with him, even though maybe some of his videos have some more editing. Now, if you go back to the start, you know, he started off with just, you know, him just talking, right? Like him not even talking about literature. He kind of moves his way toward it. And they're very kind of, but you develop, you know, I've been watching him for years and you kind of develop this um, relationship with him. And that makes you want to watch his videos more. It makes you take him more seriously because he has the time. If you look at some of these videos, it's like, we, how, how do you read Walt Whitman? You kind of, I watched that video, you kind of just, just go into it for an hour and there's a little bit more analysis there. You kind of get to these points and that's what people want to see more. And then if you click on this guy's Patreon, he if you look at like some of his posts, we have 83 com 83 likes, 100 comments. Like so you could tell and if he's charging $25 per person and we have at least 100 people liking it, there's probably a thousand people signed up or, or hundreds, you know, and at $25 a month, suddenly he's making six figures, very similar channel sizes, you know. We have 122,000 subscribers um 6 million views so you know a little bit more action going on there but probably 10 times the income and i would say 10 times the impact and that's probably why it's doing you know he has that success because he's able to go a little bit deeper i mean if you look that's what these that's what these videos are it's him going for an hour and 20 minutes on othello or you know even just like um you know some a, a segment of a book usually his videos are over an hour long and that's commendable that's worth the money in my opinion that's great $25 a month to get a huge access you know here i am you know shilling hey you guys should join my Cormac McCarthy course for $5 a month. But you know, a lot of my videos, I will go 10 hours 
on the Orchard Keeper. There's 10 hours of content on the Orchard Keeper. There's probably two or three hours already on Outer Dark that I'm building. And in these, you know, analyses, I'm talking okay, about, everyone, there's about 30 pages here. There's only 30 pages of content, but I'm spending 25 minutes on that. And then if you, you know, look at a 250 page novel, suddenly there's hours and then there's all the supplementary text and our videos and all of that. So that's kind of the goal, I think, you know, of being a creator and where video essays fall short is that there's not enough focus most of the time on one topic. And there's not that relationship being built because I make mistakes all the time in my videos. Like you guys see it, you guys tell me, I'm there in the comments. I'm I'm uh, saying crazy things and getting flack for it. You guys are witnessing all of it. And so then you trust me more. You trust me when I say, hey, I did 10 hours on out, or, excuse me, on the Orchard Keeper. Like, okay, Ian probably went pretty deep there. Like, it's not going to be a summary video like Windy Goon. You could say the same thing about um, Benjamin and some of the other big booktube creators that go deep. You, you gain trust there and then you go deeper. So that's what I would say. Um, you know, maybe do a little bit less editing, give yourself more time. And that seems what he's, he seems to be doing with adding himself in more and talk about these ide ideas deeper because I've watched some of his previous videos and I know he's, I know he's smart enough to follow up. He, he got there. He made the theory or at least found it and synthesized it. And so now take it to the next level. And I think us as the readers will appreciate it because I was sitting on the edge of my seat, like hearing these ideas, some of which I've maybe never thought of or put together in that way. And this epoch philosophy guy didn't, didn't follow through, which is what you, I, you know, is the promise as a creator. You know, I understand that it was an introductory video and he wasn't trying to create spoilers. But once again, as I talked about earlier, that's one of the kind of problems with not doing spoilers is that you stay at the surface level when pe what people want is beyond the surface level. They actually want transformation. That's the core of literature. That's the core of all of actually art in general is we want to be transformed. And what we're doing right here on YouTube is not just passive information. It's not hopefully just passive consumption, but an opportunity for to, you know, from me to you or from another creator to you to help you transform and move into some different ideas. But just telling you and showing you the cookie isn't actually giving you the cookie and letting you feel how the cookie makes you feel. So let me know your guys' thoughts on this video. I know, you know, the last couple of minutes here were kind of a rant fest. But that was actually kind of the point because I want you guys to kind of understand where I'm coming from and how I think other creators can maybe do a better job and contribute their unique ideas because there were some unique ideas in there that maybe warrant their own video. And the other reason that you, you know, when you're making a channel like this, you want to remember that you don't want to pigeonhole yourself. Like people like right now I'm transitioning to new authors. I'm not just a McCarthy guy. I do other type of content. And when you're making this content, you don't want just to pigeonhole yourself into these small videos or these singular ideas. You want to be able to, you know, do everything and have that type of flexibility. That's the same with any artistic endeavor. That's what Cormac McCarthy did. He was writing Southern novels, Southern Gothic. Then he transitioned to Western novels and he wrote some kind of eccentric screenplays that were set in cities and stuff and then transitioned to science and, you know, was living, a, uh, was interested in so many other fields of knowledge. You want that flexibility and you want to ensure that your business or your art is created from kind of day one to be able to ensure that you're able to move around and it doesn't cause such a ruckus. Because if this guy split this up into 10 videos and did a series on Cormac McCarthy, he'd get a lot of people. But we're probably seeing the end of his Cormac McCarthy career, even though it's really just the beginning. Uh, all these different ideas here, if we're looking at the philosophy of Jesus or uh, Zizek and Lacan, Noam Chomsky, there's massive audiences out there that are really unfulfilled. And by researching all this and understanding all this and being able to synthesize it in a simple way, he could also do that in a deeper way. And he could, in principle, um, you know, start the first video off like this, you know, start a video off like this. And I'm just kind of giving advice to creators right now. You start, and here I am, I only have 9,000. Why should I be saying this? Well, I'm looking at a different vision. I'm looking hopefully to help us go deeper as a knowledge community. And to do that, we need, you know, so do an introduction video like any of these and then dive deeper into some of the theories in there. Maybe do that on your Patreon or something somewhere else, you know. I think that would be, you know, that's easy to do. And that's what I'm advocate, advocating for. But who knows, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.